This presentation is to introduce you to the morphology of anterior teeth. With almost all entities in nature, there is a definite form as related to purpose and function. The teeth are no exception. Each individual tooth is specifically designed morphologically to perform a definite function at its position within the dental arch. We have already studied posterior teeth. We have seen that their size, shape, number of cusps, and number of roots are specifically designed for the grinding of teeth at their position along the fulcrum of the lower jaw. The remaining component of the dentition, which we will now consider, is the anterior teeth. The anterior teeth in man do not play the same functional role as that played in lower animals. That is, the tearing and holding of food. In man, this function has been taken over by the hands. Still, the anterior teeth of men bear a morphological similarity to the anterior component of lower forms. There are six maxillary anterior teeth and six mandibular anterior teeth. These consist of a pair of incisors, a pair of lateral incisors, and a pair of cuspids or canines in each dental arch. Each pair represent mirror images of the other. As you already know, the upper teeth overlap the lower teeth in a static relationship in centric occlusion. Anteriorly, this relationship shows variation to the degree of overlap in both the horizontal and vertical planes. The degree of overlap is very important to the functional or dynamic relationship of the anterior component, which we call anterior guidance. This static overlap can be viewed in both the vertical plane as well as the horizontal plane. Vertical overlap, which is the amount of tooth structure of the lower incisors covered by the upper incisors, is referred to as overbite. In this patient, we see that his overbite covers about 40 to 60 percent of the lower central incisors. This patient we would judge as having a relatively severe overbite. Overlap, which occurs in the horizontal plane, which means the distance between the anterior maxillary segment and the anterior mandibular segment, is referred to as overjet. Here is a case of a severe horizontal overlap or overjet. As stated before, the degree of horizontal and vertical overlap is very important to us clinically. And for that reason, part of our initial diagnosis should rest in determining the degree of both a horizontal overlap, which would simply be to measure the distance between the incisal edge of the maxillary anterior teeth and the labial surface or incisal edge of the lower anterior teeth as well as the degree of vertical overlap. Here we can simply mark with a pencil mark the degree of overlap in a vertical plane and measure it with a measuring device. Next, let us briefly review terminology as it relates to anterior teeth. Basically, we have three principal surfaces. We have a labial surface or a lip surface. We have a lingual surface. 
and a proximal surface. This would be related to both mesial and distal surfaces. As you know, we can divide the crowns both incisal cervically into thirds as an incisal third, middle third, cervical third, and we can invite, divide them into thirds mesial distally as a mesial third, middle third, and distal third. This becomes very important to us in our terminology in knowing where heights of contour and contact points occur. A brief review of height of contour or crest of contour. We speak of crest of contour as being the widest convexity of a tooth. This becomes extremely important in the anterior segment because how the anterior teeth reflect light determines in many ways the acceptance of a dental restoration in the anterior segment of the mouth. Anterior teeth have a biting edge which is referred to as the incisal edge rather than an occlusal surface as we see in posterior teeth. Also, the facial surface is referred to as labial or lip surface. Anterior teeth have marginal ridges and the marginal ridges are located at the mesial and distal terminations of the lingual surfaces and are more or less parallel to the long axis of the tooth. In contrast, marginal ridges of posterior teeth are located on the occlusal surface. Line angles are present on anterior teeth as they are on posterior teeth and the line angles are named for the two surfaces which join together. For instance, the linguo incisal line angle or the mesiolingual line angle. There are also point angles <coughs> which occur in anterior teeth as in posterior teeth and these point angles would be named according to the three surfaces which join together. There are general characteristics to the crowns of anterior teeth, particularly when we view them at various sides. Basically, from the labial surface, the crowns of anterior teeth are trapezoid in shape. If we were to view them from the proximal, we would see that they are basically triangular in shape. Let us now consider some specific morphological characteristics of each of the anterior teeth. First, we will consider the maxillary central incisor. The maxillary central incisors have mesial contact with each other and distal contact with lateral incisors. From the labial surface, we see that the crown is slightly longer incisal cervically than it is wide mesial distally. However, these two dimensions are more nearly equal in the central incisor than in any other permanent incisor. The labial surface is generally convex in both directions, mesial distally and incisal cervically. 
This convexity is most prominent in the cervical one-third. The height of contour lies within the cervical one-third of the labial surface. The convexity approaches flatness in the middle and incisal thirds. On the labial surface, we see that the mesial margin is slightly convex or nearly straight. The contact area is near the mesial incisal angle. The distal margin is more rounded than the mesial. The crest of contour is located at the contact area, which is located at the junction of the incisal and middle thirds. Therefore, it is more cervically placed than is the mesial contact point. The lingual surface narrows from the labial so that we have an FL taper. The lingual surface has both convexities and concavities. The incisal half of the lingual surface, there is a large shallow concavity termed the lingual fossa. This is made pre prominent by the presence of the mesial and distal marginal ridges. There is a large convexity in the cervical portion of the lingual surface, which is termed the cingulum. In general, the lingual fossa is smooth, but on occasion, it reveals faint ridges. These ridges, when present, may be one in number, two, or three, and may take on various shapes. This is a picture of an extracted central incisor of the maxillary arch. Here we see the general characteristics that we have pointed out in our line drawings. Notice the approximus area of contact on the mesial as opposed to that contact area on the distal. Notice the variation in size and shape of both line angles on both the mesial and the distal. Here we see a lingual view of two maxillary central incisors. We see that there is a concavity known as the lingual fossa, which is made prominent by the mesial and the distal marginal ridges. There are faint ridges within the fossa, and each of these teeth represent variation in shape. Also, we may point out that the incisal edge is broad. It runs from the labio incisal line angle to the linguo incisal line angle. This is the incisal edge. The anterior teeth in young people with newly erupted anterior teeth show ridges. These ridges are referred to as mammalons and represent the three lobes of development of the tooth. With age and with increased wear, the mammalons or ridges wear down until the incisal edge becomes flat.
Next, we will consider the maxillary lateral incisor. From the labial surface, we see that the lateral incisor is smaller in all directions than the maxillary central incisor. It sits slightly gingival to the incisal plane. From the mesial aspect, the mesial incisal angle is more rounded than the central incisor and the contact area is a little further gingivally on the mesial than is the contact area for the central incisor. The distal incisal angle is much more rounded with a more cervically placed crest of contour at about the middle third of the distal aspect of the labial surface. The incisal edge resembles the central incisor, but it is not as straight, partially because of the greater distal rounding. From the le mesial, excuse me, from the lingual surface, we see that the mesial and the distal marginal ridges, as well as the cingulum, are relatively more prominent, and the lingual fossa is deeper than the central incisor. A linguo-gingival groove is a much more common finding in the lateral incisor than in the central incisors. Many times a lingual pit near the center of this groove is also more common and when present is the site of a carious lesion. Here is a slide of an extracted lateral incisor of the maxillary arch. We see that on the mesial side of the labial surface that our contact area is much more incisally placed than it is on the distal, that the distal contact area is more cervically placed and therefore the distal aspect of the lateral is more rounded. There are individual variations as to the degree of roundness, and we will consider this aspect of anterior tooth aesthetics in another tape. From the lingual surface, we see that there is a very prominent lingual fossa, which is made prominent by the large mesial and distal marginal ridges. We see that at the convergence of the marginal ridges and the cingulum, we get a lingual groove, lingual-gingival groove. Many times we find that there is a pit associated with this that collects food debris and sets up an area for caries. Also notice the breadth of the incisal edge from the linguo incisal line angle and the facio or labio incisal line angle. Next we will consider the permanent mandibular central incisor. This tooth has the smallest crown size of any permanent tooth. The crown is very symmetrical with mesial and distal halves nearly identical. From the labial aspect, we see that the mesial margin normally tapers evenly toward the gingiva in nearly a straight line. The mesial incisal angle is sharp. The height of contact at the contact area in the incisal third, very close to the incisal edge. Distally, on the labial surface, the outline is straight and similar to the mesial outline, also with similarly shaped distoincisal angle. The height of contour is also in the incisal third. 
Incisally, we see that after incisal wear has obliterated the mammalons, the incisal edge is straight and at right angles to the long axis of the tooth. The labial height of contour is located in the cervical third. From the lingual aspect, we see that the lingual surface is relatively smooth with very little detail. Structures of the lingual surface are much less prominent on the mandibular than they are in the maxillary incisors. There is usually a slight concavity or lingual fossa bordered by indistinct marginal ridges mesially and distally. There are normally no grooves, fissures, or pits on the lingual surface. The cingulum is prominent, although not as much as in the maxillary incisors. The lingual height of contour is located in the cervical third. Here is a view of an extracted mandibular central incisor. Notice the symmetry mesial and distally, and notice the approximate height of the mesial and distal contact points or areas. From the lingual surface, we see that it is basically very smooth with little detail. The mesial and distal marginal ridges are quite faint, and we do not have the lingual fossa nor the anatomical distinctness of the lingual surface that we see in the maxillary incisors. Next, we will consider the mandibular lateral incisor. The mandibular lateral incisor is slightly larger in all respects than the mandibular central incisor, but otherwise resembles it very closely in form. The mandibular lateral resembles the mandibular central so closely that only a few comparisons are necessary. From the labial surface, we see that the incisal margin may slope slightly gingivally toward the distal, with a resultant distal incisal angle more rounded than the distal incisal angle of the central. The contact area on the distal is more cervically located than it is on the mesial. From the lingual aspect, we see that it is essentially the same as a mandibular central incisor. Here is an extracted lateral incisor, and we see a very prominent, sharp, mesial incisal line angle at the contact area. And yet on the distal, we see that it is basically rounded. Our incisal edge may or may not be parallel or, I'm sorry, perpendicular to the long axis of the tooth. There might be a slight distal slope. Basically speaking, it is very similar. When we consider the maxillary cuspid, there are general characteristics about all cuspids, both maxillary and mandibular, that we should first of all mention. Permanent cuspids in each arch resemble each other very closely. We often refer to the cuspids as being the cornerstones of the mouth due to their arch position and their intermediate form between incisors and posterior teeth. In form, they have the general triangular shape as the incisors when viewed from the proximal, and they have the same facial shape being trapezoidal when viewed from the labial. However, from the facial surface, they do resemble premolars. They have a biting edge or an incisal edge. They have a cingulum. They have marginal ridges and other similarities to anterior teeth. While a cusp is present and makes this 
very similar to posterior teeth. The cuspids are the longest teeth in the mouth. The thick labial plate of bone overlying the cuspid in the maxillary arch causes a bulge in the bone, and this bulge is referred to as the canine eminence. When we consider more detail of the maxillary cuspid, we see that from the labial aspect, it is convex in all directions, both mesial distally and incisal cervically. The mesial margin is usually convex from mesial contact area to cervical line with a rounded mesial incisal angle. The height of contour of the mesial is at the contact area of the facial surface, which is located near the junction of the incisal and middle thirds. The distal margin is shorter than the mesial margin and is usually concave between the distal contact area and the cervical line. It also has rounded incisal angle and the height of contour is at the contact area in the middle third. So we see that the contact area for the distal aspect of the maxillary cuspid is more cervically placed than is the mesial contact area. The incisal margin is divided into two components by the tip of the cusp. Therefore, in essence, we have two cusp arms, a mesial incisal arm and a distal incisal arm, which we refer to as cusp ridges. The mesial is shorter than the distal, primarily due to the placement of the contact areas, mesially and distally. The cusp tip is usually over the long axis of the tooth. However, wear may move the cusp tip distally or obliterate it altogether. The labial surface exhibits a labial ridge incisal gingivally due to the greater development of the middle lobe of this tooth. From the lingual aspect of the maxillary cuspid, we see that the mesial distal diameter of the lingual surface is less than the labial. Therefore, again, we have a definite FL taper. The cingulum is located in the gingival half of the surface and is bulky, but normally smooth. It shows greater development than the cingulum of other anterior teeth. The mesial and distal marginal ridges are also very bulky and very prominent. The incisal half of the lingual surface is generally smooth, but there is normally a lingual ridge extending incisal gingivally in the center with shallow fossa in between. When we view an extracted maxillary cuspid, we see the very prominent distal bulge of the facial surface. We see the difference in the incisal ridges, mesially and distally, with the mesial being shorter than the distal. We also see a very prominent labial ridge and a definite cusp tip. Viewed from the lingual surface, we see the very prominent cingulum area. We also see the prominent mesial and distal marginal ridges. 
In the tooth on the left, we see a very prominent lingual ridge with two fossa in between. As with other anterior teeth, we see that cuspids show variation in morphology on the lingual surface. Notice also the incisal edge, which runs from the labio-incisal angle to the lingual-incisal angle. The mandibular cuspid, as we have said, is extremely similar to the maxillary cuspid. The crown is as long or even longer than the maxillary cuspid. There is somewhat smaller mesial distally and labial lingually than the maxillary, which means that it might be somewhat narrower in dimensions than the maxillary cuspid. The lingual surface is less well developed than the maxillary cuspid. And the cusp is not as well developed as is the maxillary. The labial surface is not as convex as the maxillary cuspid. When viewed from the mesial, we see that the outline is basically straight from the contact area to the cervical line with some convexity. On the distal aspect, we see that it is more rounded with the distal incisal edge or ridge being longer due to the position of the contact area. This is an extracted mandibular cuspid, and we see the similarities of this cuspid to the maxillary. We see that it may be longer, but it is not as wide mesiodistally as the maxillary. Still, we have the same basic features as the maxillary cuspid. When viewed from the lingual, we see that we do have a cingulum, but faint mesial and distal marginal ridges. We do not have the distinct lingual ridge, nor the distinct fossa. It is basically smooth, with less detail than the maxillary. In summary, we have considered the morphological aspects of the anterior segment of human dentition. We have seen that they bear similarities to the dentition of lower forms. We have considered morphological entities so that we can compare and reproduce each one of the individual teeth. From the standpoint of dental restorations, in doing aesthetic dentistry, it is vitally important for the restorative dentist to know the morphological components of the anterior teeth. When a restoration is done, it must blend perfectly with the remaining anterior teeth so that your dental restoration will escape detection. Next, I would like to point out a few important things that would be necessary as a starting point in reproducing or carving anterior teeth. We have stressed the importance of anterior tooth morphology as well as contour. But the very logical question is, where do I begin now in reproducing anterior teeth? First, we have to be very aware of embrasure spaces, the spaces between the teeth. We have to allow room interproximally for the gingiva 
Our restorations cannot be over-contoured mesially or distally simply because of the impingement upon the opposing tissue. We have to be aware of heights of contour or crests of contour and contour connecting lines. If we were to view an anterior tooth Our starting point would be to mark our crest of contour. We have a labial crest of contour, and we have a lingual crest of contour, both occurring essentially in the cervical or gingival third. We have line angles going to our mesial and our distal contact area. This would be our labio, our mesiolabial line angle and our distolabial line angle. We also have an incisal labial line angle. and a linguo incisal line angle. So this becomes our incisal edge. In reproducing the facial surface, it's very important for us to know the position of these heights of contour along these line angles simply because by the reflection of light off of these heights of contour, we can make a large tooth look small by simply placing the height of contour closer together. Or we can make a small tooth look large by spreading out our heights of contour. Likewise, we can connect all of our heights of contour around the tooth so that we begin to see more of the marginal ridges and of our lingual fossa. This is a good point to start in reproducing anterior teeth. First of all, know where your heights of contour are located. Next, if we were to remove a cuspid, we would approach the cuspid in much the same way. We would mark our facial height of contour and our lingual height of contour. And then we would draw our connecting contour lines. Each time remembering the morphological characteristics of the position of the mesial and the distal contact area. Remember that the cuspid resembles both anterior teeth as well as posterior teeth. It has a labial ridge. Not only does it have a crest of contour from the labial that is a ridge, but the ridge also has width. And we're going to have to reproduce the width of that ridge. It becomes very important it has a cuss tip that lies over the long axis of the tooth. It also has an incisal edge, as well as a lingual ridge. 
and lingual fossa. On the cuspid, it is very important for you to understand proximal contour and the proximal concavities along the cervical area in the cervical third. If we were to place this tooth back into the dental arch to articulate the teeth again, we would see that a helpful hint will be to approach the reproduction of these anterior teeth in two planes. You might want to, to look down the incisal edge to one plane, which is right at the crest of contour, to make sure that you are in agreement with the other teeth. And then by simply turning it a little bit more, so that you can see past the height of contour, you can see the second plane, which would lie in the cervical area. It might be helpful for you to put your finger across the labial surface of the teeth in the gingival region here in order to better visualize this two-plane concept. Also, it should be important for you to view the cuspid the cuspid is difficult to reproduce simply because it has characteristics of both anterior and posterior teeth. With this very prominent labial ridge, you will have a tendency to over-contour this labial ridge. In order to avoid doing that, be sure that you turn your deniform to the side so that you can see the distal aspect of the labial surface of this tooth and that it, when looked on from the labial surface, you should not have the distal surface obliterated by this very prominent labial ridge. These tips should be helpful as a starting point for you to begin your morphological waxing procedure for the anterior segment.